let me just start by welcome to Book Talk Conversation. My guest today is Forrest Landry, and it's a little difficult to know where to start to talk about this uh, person, this brilliant mind, but let me give you a few of the domains in which you can find him. He has been a philosopher and is a philosopher, a writer, a researcher, a scientist, an engineer, craftsman and teacher. And one of the things I love very much, a woodworker. This is someone who goes from the heights of metaphysics to working with his hands to create things. Now that's a very unusual combination. It's When I look at the domains that Forrest Landry covers, it's a little bit like viewing uh, the background of someone who has been and is a professional baseball player, professional basketball player, professional football player, professional ice hockey player. And after a game, he goes back to his hotel room and pins these wonderful philosophical essays on metaphysics. And what I mean by metaphysics is Forrest Landry gets into the deep weeds on our concepts of ethics and morality and the connection between those and effective communication. So today I'm hoping that in this conversation, by going back to your early readings that formulated the structure that you have to see the world, that we'll get some insights into how these building blocks came together to form an underlying worldview, particularly about ethics and morality. So I, th I think uh, that's in terms of an introduction, there are many other things that could be said about Forrest Landry. But what I'd like to do is to ask Forrest a little bit of a background on your early reading environment. W did you grow up in a house with books? Was there a reading uh, culture in uh, your household? Uh, was there a teacher? Give us a little bit of a background of that childhood. And what I mean by childhood is seven to 24 years old. Now that's a pretty wide range. And why have I taken seven to 24? I can explain. It's uh, cicadas. They have a 17 year cycle. They basically emerge after 17 years and are ready for the world. And this happens to be the year of the 17th year of that cycle. So the cicadas are coming out of the ground and forest laundry, I am asking you to go back to the beginning of that cycle uh, from kind of age seven to 24 so we can see what has emerged in your writing. Beautiful, brilliant. Um, well, I grew up in a small town in rural Maine. So the state of Maine, you know, far country, basically. Sure. And uh, as a small town, there wasn't necessarily uh, a lot of emphasis on, um, you know, educational process. I mean, it was, it's, it's, it's just a, a basic, uh, uh, you know, Maine location. So it has the kind of personality of that state. Um, as far as my family was concerned, I did have a fairly unusual upbringing. Um, my father is a woodworker, as was my grandfather, um, and uh, my mother paints. So my mother was an artist, and both of them basically worked at the house. So my father was in the Air Force, uh, you know, when I was born, but he purchased a house in 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 this little town, and the barn that was essentially used for the horses and the livestock and stuff like that, he converted that into a shop. So he had a, a fairly large, uh, you know, typically a wood shop isn't necessarily a very large space, but this was uh, a, a, a very good sized space for doing um, cabinetry, basically. What's, what he was, he was doing woodworking was essentially uh, making kitchen cabinets, making tables and chairs and, and um, you know, the kind of household goods that would be used by the community for their, their own living situation. Uh, but he did do a number of things at the local bank. Um, there were a number of churches in the area. Was, small town was kind of famous for having a very wide variety of uh, religious institutions. There was uh, Russian Orthodox and uh, 
um, you know, a Jewish synagogue and, and obviously several varieties of, of uh, Christian faith and such like that. Um, but in, in this specific sense, um, while he was doing, uh, you know, making pews and, 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 you know, doing, you know, basic woodworking for the community, including all of that, um, he was not himself a religious person. I was raised in a more secular humanist uh, kind of orientation. Uh, and they told me later on that they, um, they wanted me to basically have the opportunity to find my own way to basically, you know, be exposed to the different things, but not necessarily to be compelled by them to choose anything in specific so that I could, I could sort of navigate uh, freely. And so that's one unusual element, but the nature of having my parents both be creative people working literally, you know, walking distance from my bedroom um, gave me a lot of exposure to uh, craft and, you know, the kind of processes associated with that. Um, so, you know, my mother had, uh, you know, books on art. Um, and I remember very specifically uh, some of the artworks that she had as being things that, that, that really informed my, my visual experience of, of, of what art is. And um, obviously as a creative person, you know, I, I experienced the notion of creativity as being a, a clear uh, thing in my life as I was growing up. So self-expression, no, no hesitation to, uh, of having modeling for that. Um, and of course, you know, being so close to the house, there was a there's a sense of comfort that's hard to explain, but that if you know where your parents are at all times, like if you, if you are exploring, you can go from the house and you can go out into the woods and because, and, you know, rural Maine, it's going to be Wellesley Woods. Um, you know, so you have the sense of, of having a home base to come back to. And that, that so it's a very base, secure and stable home environment, it, at which least was, as, you yeah. know, based and around creativity. As, yeah, as far as creativity and as far as presence is concerned. Now, I mean, I, I won't say it was all kumbaya and everything. <laughs> there were definitely uh, emotional things that that, that, that that could have been maybe a little easier. But um, there are definitely, uh, at least on my father's side, a considerable number of books that he had with him. Um, so in other words, you know, the household had books around. And so it was the collection that he had sort of accumulated over his lifetime. Uh, he was college educated. And so had, you know, some of those kinds of interests and resources uh, back when uh, going to college was done more from a uh, perspective of learning rather than just for a sense of, of developing a career or having a business or, or, or things that would be useful uh, in the work world. Uh, his was more of a liberal arts education for the sake of learning. Um, so I had on one hand the, uh, the, the real sense of you know, how creativity happens and the, the sort of tools and techniques and, and resources that sort of go into that um, because they were both self-employed. My father was essentially, you know, working out of the house to, and he would meet with people. So I, I learned how to, to talk to customers and, and the kind of relationships and how we would go into the woods and, and literally make wood. Like we, we talk to woodworkers or tree cutters, for example, and then we'd we'd follow the steps through to have it sawn into boards. Like we would buy a log and have it sawn at a local sawmill. And then we would dry the wood ourselves. And, and so I, I apprenticed to my dad through uh, my teens, essentially. Uh, so on one hand, I had this uh, very practical experience of, of just how things are just done. And on the other hand, I had this sort of uh, emotional, creative uh, kind of process. And then there's this third piece, which was this uh, very engineering oriented intellectual piece that was partially in connection to to the, the things I was learning at the time I I was uh, very into computers and I was very into electronics I was also very curious about you know things in 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 physics and math and stuff like that so you know those those three influences were really quite strong in the in the household um, you know my my parents weren't necessarily into electronics or technology or anything like that at all, but my father couldn't help be that to some extent because of the nature of the, of the tools and the stuff that needed to be done in order to, to shape wood into, into furniture, essentially. Did they encourage your reading? And uh, did you talk uh, about books, say over a family meal or? Well, no, actually. Um, so for whatever uh, I mean, this is maybe a little embarrassing to even say this, but um, for whatever reason, 
I was a late bloomer. I, I started my, my intellectual quote unquote career started relatively late. I, I didn't really speak much or write or read or do anything like that until um, I think well into first or second grade. Right. Um, so they, at that time, were having me tested for retardation or developmental disabilities or, or things like that. And uh, for some reason or other, I did really well on a test. So it was clear that, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't disabled in some way. But on the other hand, for, for some reason or other, I just didn't take, right? Sure. Um, and my, my father basically, as, as a kind of, you know, sort of measure of, of last resort, he gave me uh, these, these comic books, uh, Mad Magazine. And, you know, his hope was, is that I would, I would, I would get into it. And that from that, I would, I would be interested enough to learn how to read. And uh, this was wildly successful. I will have you know, I mean, I just, <laughs> I, 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 I recognized that it was to some extent sort of like, well, we're, we're trying to, 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 to figure out how to make this work. And um, that, that was essentially, so like between my first and second grade, I, I believe, um, you know, I attended a, um, there, was, there was some special program they had for people that were behind, basically. Sure. And it was around that time that this, this you know, first uh, exposure to, to real reading happened. And, I, and I, I don't remember how old I was, but, but this was actually my first starting to read. And I, it was like the light went on. Um, all of a sudden, uh, I just really got into it. I really started reading a lot. So by the, by the, end, that, by the end of that summer, I had not only gone through the program, but I had all of a sudden caught up for all of the time that I had missed in first grade. And within a month of, of, of you know, that, that first year, I was starting to get ahead of people. And by the time, uh, I don't know, that winter rolled around, I was far enough ahead that it was starting to become like, you know, something else again. <laughs> So intellectual um, steroids at, at some point is, yeah, it's, it's like you, the afterburners kicked in or, or, right. or something, you know, just, I, I, I just all of a sudden discovered it as a vehicle for um, really being able to satisfy my curiosity. I had a deep and abiding curiosity. I wanted to know yeah. all sorts of things. I had a, I had a bad habit of taking stuff apart. Sure. So, um, you know, there's this one, one, one incident where I, 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 you know, my father would bring something home and he'd turn around an hour later, it'd be, you know, disassembled on the floor. And I would like have looked at all the pieces and figured out how all the stuff worked and so on and so forth. Right. And he'd, he'd say, he'd beg me, he'd, please put this back together. Can I actually need this thing? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I became, uh, you know, very, very much into reading because, uh, it was it was a way for me to experience the world in a much richer way than I would have otherwise been able to. Um, so although, you know, there wasn't necessarily a very wide selection in my father's books, he probably had, I would guess, somewhere around two to 500 books all told right. in the house altogether. Okay. And um, the town was small enough. I think there was only like, you know, between there's there's fewer than 10,000 people. There's maybe only like two, three thousand people in the town. So they had a local library, but the library was mostly fiction. So I discovered, um, you know, a lot of uh, Alfred Hitchcock at the time and uh, other sure. things of, of, of a more, um, you know, general historical nature and stuff like that. But, um, and, I, and I, like I said, I became interested enough in reading and so on and so forth that I actually volunteered uh, at the local library. They were only open uh, a few days a week and there were pretty odd hours. I mean, it was like, you know, two to 5 p.m. on a Tuesday or something like that. Um, but it happened that I could be there um, some amount of time to to basically volunteer to help, you know, check out books and stuff like that and organize things. Uh, and so I did that when I was in um, grade school or high school or something like that so that I, I had more access to uh, two books at the time. Uh, so that increased my exposure by maybe another 10,000 volumes or so. But again, not technical literature. So I was feeling really hungry for uh, things in the science and technology space um, for, for a number of reasons. I mean, I, I, I again, it was, it was partly curiosity, but I, I wanted to know how to make things. I wanted to know how to build stuff. Sure. So, you know, having the, the shop basically gave me the confidence that I could make things, but I didn't have the technical know-how to do that outside of woodworking. And so, you know, in effect, I wanted to, 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 to go to see, 
um, you know, more than, than, than I was able to get access to. Um, and so the, it, it, it turned out that the only real way I could actually solve this problem was to, um, so I, I, I had a bicycle and I would do this thing called the mirror meeting bay circuit. So I would go from Richmond over the Richmond Dresden Bridge and into Days Ferry and then through Days Ferry into Woolwich and then from Woolwich into Bath and then there would be a used bookstore in Bath because that was like a metropolis of sorts. They had Bath Ironworks there. And so there was actually like a capacity for me to buy books on a much wider variety of subjects. Um, then I would go, you know, to Cook's Corner and then from, from there to um, Bowdoin College, which had, of course, a university library. And, you know, I, I wasn't old enough to get a library card at that space, but they would let me in the building and I could, you know, browse the stacks and learn how to use the card catalog and look at all of the different things. And I, I, I probably got more of an education reading books at the Bowdoin College Library than I, than I probably did through any other thing I've done since. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, I was every every other weekend. I basically would spend the day to do this circuit because it was forty four miles. I mean, you know, it was it was a long it was a long trip. Um, and for for someone that was uh, not necessarily that old, uh, it, it took a substantial amount of physical endurance to do this. Um, anyways, so the the point is is that um, I guess uh, at at a certain point, I, I did start to, to to have my curiosities, you know, really met by. Um, all, all the reading that I was doing, but this, of course, you know, you're, you're speaking. You, you asked from seven to uh, to 24 years, so this yeah. would have been uh, when I was say uh, 13, 14, 15, um, you know, years of age that I was. That would sort of been the that. kind of the early adolescence would have been crucial years for you in the discovery yeah. of books. And and to kind of summarize, it looks like the the initial stage was really heavily on humanities and fiction. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe the social scientist uh, in you was evolving through that early reading. I mean, one of the things that would be interesting is what in that early reading kind of led you to uh, emphasize this looking for traps, ambushes, uh, the unexpected, which the best, of course, fiction is designed to do that. It is takes us really to the first books on your list, which is Mind Benders and Mazes, uh -huh. of looking at the world in terms of there are obstacles, there are blind alleys, there are uh, puzzles and paradoxes and uncertainty. So that seems to me to be one of the things that comes out of when I read through the books that you have. Uh, said that we're going to discuss today, uh, you know, I'm looking at these kind of key words for me, nature, mm -hmm. fractals, scale, complex system, symbolic, mystical stories and metaphors, math, recursion, self-sufficiency, chaos, choice, experience, and effective communication. Yeah, that subs it up uh, pretty well, actually. I the question's a delightful one, although part of the driver for why I was, um, I guess, very interested in exploring. You, you mentioned it as a as a kind of interest in humanities, but I think that it actually comes a little bit closer to an interest in psychology. Okay. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, on one hand, there was this uh, this real emotional security in the sense of knowing where my folks were. But there was also this deep sense of detachment. Um, you know, there's, there's, there was a, you know, I don't, I don't really want to get into the kind of psychological dynamics of families, but, but our family, like seven eighths of most families in the world, had intense psychological dynamics. And yeah. so, in effect, I was, I was very interested to try to understand what were the kinds of conditions under which people, uh, you know, interacted with the world. Like, how do people actually relate to one another? Really, how how do we solve effectively emotional problems? How how do we deal with those kinds of things? So, in in effect, there was, and again, it's it's it is this sort of mix because on one hand, I I really enjoyed um, science and technology and 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 things like that because they were tractable, you could understand them and you could, you could solve problems with them. There was a kind of visibility that you would have to be able to, to work with those kinds of things. But I never lost sight of the fact that uh, 
even if you're really good at dealing with uh, these abstractions, that that doesn't help you to really understand humanity. It doesn't help you to understand yourself. It doesn't help you to understand relationships or what a healthy relationship looks like. So in a lot of, a lot of it, I was, I was aware that there were certain psychological dynamics in my upbringing that were to some extent very different than for other people. And so I, I, I wanted to do a kind of calibration. I wanted to really understand what is healthy families. What is healthy communication? Sure. What is a healthy psychological dynamic? And how do I uh, normalize my own sense of my own expectations as to what that needs to be? So in effect, the, the desire for effective communication, I think largely comes from that basis. I wonder if also if it comes a little bit of going with your father into the woods to talk to the woodsman. Mm -hmm. Most people see a chair, but they don't see the wood in place in a tree that makes the chair. And it seems to me what you're saying is you were looking for the connection between what I see in the forest and what I sit on at the table. Yeah, that connection wasn't something I needed to look for. I, I knew the connection. I mean, it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to explain in words because the felt sense of connection that I have with nature is so immediate, it's so complete and present actually it's quite visibly difficult for me to imagine what it would be like to be without that. Yeah. So, you know, on one hand, there was a, a, a sort of understanding of the relationship between nature and, and how it produces wood and how we use that wood to make things that people then experience in their domestic environments. But that um, just on a, on a sense of the feeling of solace that one has when they're in the woods or the, the kind of emotional comfort that one can gain from the complete acceptance that, that, that nature shows, that nature shows us. Like, you know, we, we, we say things like, you know, man's best friend, you know, a dog has complete acceptance of you. doesn't, doesn't judge you for any of the behaviors you might have. I mean, if you were cruel to the dog, it might judge you for that, but, but for the most part, it's not going to have, you know, high level intellectual constructs as to evaluate your morality or ethics or anything like that. So in effect, the, the notion is, is that when you, when you're thinking about it as an animate animal, then there's a, there's a sense of, of, you know, this animal accepts me. Or I, I am feeling loved by this creature. But when you are in nature and you can connect to the sense that nature itself accepts you at least as fully as that animal does in right. a specific instance, um, then there's a, there's a kind of um, resilience that that gives you at an emotional level that's just really hard to, to, to even explain to someone who's never experienced it. There's a... There's a sense of groundedness that nature has. So on one hand, I'm, I'm experiencing this, this, as you mentioned, a sort of mystical or spiritual connection of just complete trust and comfort that I can navigate in nature as a being. Right. And at the same time, you know, again, like I said, part of that is, is grounded in this very practical firsthand experience of, yeah, I actually know how to make furniture from scratch. And so my curiosity extended into, well, not can I just even make the, the furniture from scratch, but can I make the tools that make sure. the furniture, right? So I, I got interested in metalworking. I got interested in machining. Um, I got interested in, in in the kinds of things that would be uh, actually crucial if we needed to restart civilization, like, you know, starting from just literally people and hands and, 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 and figuring out how to, uh, you know, create everything that we would need to survive. Um, there, there are people, survivalists, who, who specialize in that sort of bootstrap set of skills. I'm certainly not as well-developed as any of them, but um, I've always had that sense of, you know, the grounded connection between these, these intellectual constructs, these emotional realities, and these sort of physical truths. Well, one of the things I think I'd like to do is maybe start with the first couple of books, because the Mindbenders' Games of Shape by Ivan Moscovich, and the books will be in the notes of the show, and Mazes by Vladimir uh, Kin uh, are two places which seems to me allow us again to go into the woods, as it were, whether practically to make a chair or we're in the woods to psychologically understand what the ethical moral framework of a person happens to be to kind of predict what kind of behavior we can expect. And one of the things with mazes and paradoxes and puzzles is that you're dealing with a world of uncertainty. And there are two things 
that are in a uh, counterfactual position. One is the uh, continuity and se uh, symmetry that people seek because there's certainty in that. And then there are, there are the disruptions, the laborists that into a dead end and how one deals with that psychologically and emotionally and intellectually. So tell us a little bit about mind benders and mazes, how they came into your life and how they kind of shaped your view from woodworking to the metaphysics. <laughs> well, mind benders is probably the easier one to describe in the sense that the, the, the orientation behind the book is how we perceive influences how we solve problems. So the, the book is a collection of puzzles. It's a collection of mostly visual puzzles. And can I ask you, you how old you were when you when you oh, read? Pretty young. I I that that's one of the very first books I, I think I, I remember really encountering as a book. Okay. Um, it was given to me uh, again. It was one of the few books that was given brand new by my dad, uh, and it was probably a Christmas or a birthday party or something like that. Um, but the, but the notion was is that uh, it, it it was very formulative for me in a certain sense, which is that it taught me to pay attention to my own perceptual process. And this this, this is something that that, that that has been a skill that, 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 that became increasingly important uh, as the abstractness of the problems increased. So in other words, as I went through life and I became uh, in, in, entangled with trying to figure out more difficult things, uh, I kept with me this sense that uh, I really wanted to explore different ways of seeing in order to be able to have the vocabulary necessary to address the problem at hand. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, again, you know, the sheer coincidence of what books show up in a person's life at a time, I, I couldn't have explained why my father picked that particular book or how that particular book came to me or why he knew it. But, it, but, it, but I, th I think he got the sense that I was, uh, obviously an intelligent person and that I was interested in solving problems. I was interested in puzzles. I was very curious and so on and so forth. So he probably expected that I would enjoy it in the sense of interesting puzzles to solve. But the, the emphasis on how we can perceive a solution, if we can get out of our own way of presupposing how we think it should be done. Uh, that sense of look for unusual or un uncommon perspective points right. to inform how we do problem solving um, has been an idea that uh, a tool that has had enormous implications for literally everything else I've done. So for example, um, in, in the EGP work that I'm doing most recently about how groups of people uh, can become more uh, capable of solving problems that affect the group, like how does a community deal with community scope issues? And so in a lot of ways, what we're looking at is, are we even asking the right questions? You know, Einstein basically pointed out uh, at one thing he was, he was basically saying, if I had a, an hour to solve a problem, I might spend 55 minutes making sure I was asking the right question because once I know the question answering, it's a lot easier. But if I'm answering the wrong question, then I'm, I'm not making any headway at all. So in effect, this emphasis on perception, on how does that perception shape and help us to know, are we asking the right questions? Are we, uh, do we know what we know? Do we, do we even have a, a good uh, you know, methodology for diversifying our capacity to imagine sufficiently well so that the solution becomes something that we can imagine? It reminds me a little bit of uh, John Berger's Ways of Seeing, mm -hmm. which was very influential as a BBC series in 1972. Again, that notion that there is more than one perspective, it goes back to your notion of fractals as well and mazes, is that you learned then very young from this, from the book Mindbenders, is that your perspective depends on where you're standing, at the base of the tree or at the top of the tree. Right. Or, or within uh, it looking out. Oh, exactly. You know, or upside down in the roots. I mean, yes. you know, there's, there's, there's all sorts of perspectives. And to, to have the willingness to, 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 to not just look for those perspectives, but to actually enjoy what you see and discover there. 
you know, in, in this sense, you know, in, in more, uh, you know, when we talk more about ethics or, or those kinds of things, okay. sometimes, uh, you know, we, we, we actually need to know the problem well enough because the problem teaches us the language yeah. within which the solution would be expressed. If we don't learn the language of the solution, we're obviously not going to be able to express it. We're not going to be aware of it. Somebody could speak it to us, but if I don't know how to understand that language, you know, it's, a, it's in Native American or something, I'm, I'm not going to be able to hear what they're saying. I so mean, one of the things I have saying, to learn. One of the things yeah. you're saying there is, is, is very, very interesting. I'd like you to kind of expand on it. It comes from, I think, James Carr's The, the Finite and Infinite Games. It's, a very important says, book. Yeah. It, what, what, what you're saying to me is you learn very early on that there are certain ways of playing the infinite game. And the infinite game is one of play, exploration, curiosity. The most important part is continuing the game, not yeah. winning, but right. continuing. That's correct. That's, that's absolutely correct. And when I encountered, uh, you know, Finite and Infinite Games by, by James Carson, I was delighted. I mean, that book uh, was, was a huge thing. I know it's not on our list, but uh, it, was, it was something I discovered later. But I, I basically... Uh, that that book was also highly influential to me, mostly because it was in this same line. It was like, you know, I, I've it, it, it's interesting in one sense because I've recommended that particular book, the the the, the finite and infinite game book, to a lot of people because because there's there's there was there's been a time where people have asked me, what would you recommend I read so that I could understand more of what your work is about? And that's right. it's actually quite challenging to suggest books for people yes. to read to basically act as a kind of intro to my own work because I, I really started from a very remote position. So um, in, in, in a lot of ways, I've, I've had a good sense as to how people can respond to the James P. Carr's book. I would suggest just on the observation of, of, of you know, more than several hundreds of people that I've talked to since after having recommended that book and after have they, have, having them read it, um, that something like only 5% of the people that read that book really understand it, that really get that sense of, of, of the, the real interchange between the finite and infinite games. They understand it sort of, but not really. So it, in a lot of ways, I, I think that, you know, when we're, when we're describing the kind of flexibility needed to solve problems, we are thinking about it as a kind of language learning facility. And it is genuinely hard to learn other languages, but I think that in some respects, doing so gives us the kind of imaginal flexibility necessary to deal with things in that problem space, in that language space. So in effect, it's a bit like saying, you know, when we encounter a problem, we are trying to learn the language of the problem first, which means we, we, need, to, we need to study the problem, not with the option of even believing that we can solve it, but just just because we need to understand the problem well enough so that we learn the language. Because then we have prepared ourselves. It, in effect, if I, if I don't prepare myself to be the vehicle that can receive a solution, that can even hold a solution, if I'm, if I'm not a vessel in some way that, that, that has, you know, there's, there's a sort of cupping hands thing. If I, sure. if I clench too tightly, the water goes through. And if my hands are wide open, the water goes through. It's only when I, when I cup just ever so gently, my hands touching and, and it's sort of enclosing the space that I can become a vehicle for holding water. Well, the first couple of books as well as with Mind Benders and Mazes is really kind of opens up the, the preparation of life is understanding if you're playing an infinite game, mm -hmm. that there's a certain kind of openness and flexibility. Right. of a welcomeness. You welcome the surprise rather than trying to be overly prepared for every surprise that makes that with the maze, you're going to be surprised quite often. People who don't like surprises will probably not enjoy mind benders or mazes because it will be frustrating. They, they wish to have a direct line from A to B. And if there are obstacles, that, that creates all kinds of psychological problems, which then become their own journey away from what, where they started. Well, it's, 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 it's interesting in some respects. So there's some real subtleties here that, so for instance, in the copy that I have, which is the original copy that, that I received, like I, I still have the book from when I was a child. In other words, I never, I never got rid of it. I still, I yeah. still own it. Um, I noticed when I was looking back at it, 
that I had literally sharpied over all the places where they had a thing that suggested how long the maze was to take to solve. And, you know, I, I, I didn't remember that I had done that. I had, I, and, and it was, it was clearly I had done it when I was really young because, you know, I wasn't too skillful at that time. And so, you know, some of it bled through, for example, but I, I, I when I was looking at that, I was like, wait a minute, what was going on here? And I, and I realized that part of what was my experience of the maze book wasn't so much about solving the maze. So some of them were, obviously I had drawn lines and I had solved the maze. And clearly we could, we could, we could describe it as a sort of game that, you know, a person can compete with themselves and try to solve it within a certain time. And it's a certain visual acuity that you can do to, to get really good. I've, I've gotten quite adept at solving mazes. Like I, I know how to glance at the pattern of the lines to identify key points of crossing that I need to go around that. So I can, I can solve a maze in a kind of holographic fractal way by the gestalt of the image of it. So in, in effect, I can solve mazes faster than the, than the times that they suggested in the book. But that wasn't what was interesting to me. And in fact, I felt that part to be a little bit offensive. What was interesting to me was not the fact that the, the maze even had a solution but the way in which the lines and the shape of the maze had a, an emotional experience as well as a logical impact. So for instance, the, the, the things about the, the, the mazes in that book, and this is, again, it's, 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 it's not easy to describe because it's an aesthetic thing. Right. The, the mazes in that book have an aesthetic quality to them. Like there's lots of mazes, like you can have a computer program that'll generate mazes all day long. And you can, have, you can have a dial that will even control how difficult those mazes are. But there's something about the mazes in that book that is whimsical, that is uh, without the kind of constraint of this is a game. It has essentially a kind of sense that, yes, there are game elements, but it's the way in which the aesthetic and the logical in the sense of this path is the only way through it's the way in which those interact with one another i mean i i spent more time looking at that book not because i had not solved the mazes but because i really wanted to understand the aesthetic of it there's it's it's because they're just lines i mean you know in effect if you if you look at say artistic styles there's a there's a whole uh movement there's it's i, I don't remember the name of it where the, the whole thing is about it's, it's a kind of minimalism. You just draw a line in space and it's a single line. You, you put your pen down once, you draw a figure and then you lift your pen up and it suggests a person or a horse or a car or something. And every little nuance of how that line is shaped, every curve, the, the, the exact ratios of the positions, you know, little wibbles here and there, all of these things are completely influential in terms of the visual impression and the emotional impact that the overall glyph gives you. So it was, it was that interchange is what I got from the Mazes book, which is actually in some respects harder to explain than, than what came out of the, um, you know, the, 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 the puzzles for the mind one, the, the sort of sense of, you know, how our perception influences our problem solving capacity. The one with the Mazes was essentially a kind of interrelationship between the logic and the aesthetic. Now, Believe me, I did not have this kind of language describing what my experience then was, but I had a fascination with those two books because I could sense these things happening. I had some intuition about it, and although I probably couldn't have put this into words, you know, for, for maybe another 20 years from when I encountered it, they really stayed with me because of that, those sorts of reasons. And I know this because I remember that aspects of myself. That's very, very interesting, uh, because I think it, it, in a sense, reading your work on ethics and morality is, in, in a way, going through a maze of, of philosophy, of psychology, of uh, sociology, of many disciplines. I mean, many domains are, are covered with this. And in a sense, a maze is going with a certain kind of fluid ability uh, and not worrying about get lost, getting lost, because sometimes getting lost is a learning experience. It's not a fearful experience. 
it's something to be welcomed because it brings something out of you, which is, I think, a nice segue into the first bits of uh, fiction, which is The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, uh, which seems to me creates a kind of fictional world of mazes, very much like the, the Odyssey created a fictional world uh, thousands of years ago, where psychologically people need some kind of guidance, instruction, in order to understand how you deal in the real world with being in an uncertain, unstable, unpredictable situation. Yeah. So let's start with uh, The Hobbit, uh, with Bilbo Baggins, and I can I can kind of understand what the attraction would be here, growing up in kind of rural Maine, and Bilbo is in a sense as a hobbit occupying uh, a life not unlike uh, your own, which was one intimately involved with nature. Right. He was one with nature and in his community, and suddenly this idea of power and evil and oppression forces him out of that cozy relationship with nature and finding abilities to create uh, alliances, to cooperate with others, to make the way through the maze and to come back home at the end. Tell us well, what age were you when you read The Hobbit? Oh man. Um... 10, 11, 12, I would guess. Okay. I don't remember. It's, it's, it, 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 I don't remember exact timelines in that sense. Um, but I do know that, again, I, I can remember what my fascinations were. Yeah. And, and, and still are to some extent. I mean, obviously, you know, when, when, when someone develops a deep and abiding interest, they, they keep the interest. Um, it was the linguistic elements initially. So in effect, like I, I was really attracted to the different writing systems that were presented in that book. I mean, like I would, I, I, I learned that, that style of calligraphy, I learned that, that symbolism and, and, and so on. Um, so it, it, it's interesting in one sense because I didn't find out until quite a bit later that part of what made Tolkien's works so good was that he really spent a lot of time studying the linguistics. Yeah. Like, he explored the relationship between language and culture in a yes. pretty profound way. Yes. And that that informed his writing. It informed his stories and informed a lot of stuff. I mean, we also uh, found out later that the times that he lived in, uh, although he didn't necessarily suggest this, um, I, I think also informed it. When you're looking at the Lord of the Rings, for example, and, and, and the context of World War, you know, again, there's, there's some profound analogs between, you know, how we think about these kinds of concepts. But in the, uh, in, 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 you know, the, the Bilbo Baggins sort of scenario of a person who is, um, you know, a little bit in an autistic sort of orientation to the world and um, is, is, is thrust into things which are very much larger than themselves. Um, there was nonetheless still a deeply romantic element to the entire uh, scenario, to, to all of the individual narratives that, that were the sort of sub elements of that story, like, um, going through the the wild woods, for example, you know they were frightening places in one sense, but but in the, but in another sense too, there was a there was a still a romantic element to that um, that 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 really was an emphasis on the on the symbolism as much as it was on the language and how the symbolism affected the culture of the of the of the participants and and the uh, the people in the story as well as obviously ourselves as readers, and so. In effect, I, um, I I remember not just being drawn into the the romantic elements, but also very, very much interested in the relationship between the language and the people. And 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 obviously, again, a completely fictional world in this particular case. But as as I you know as I mentioned earlier, I was I was particularly interested in the sort of psychological elements, the anthropological elements, and the sort of you know, if we were to create a kind of romanticized uh, situation of what relationships, teamwork, and such like that would look like, you know, what sort of things would facilitate that? What sort of languages, what sort of cultural symbolism, what kind of process would would, would really do that? And so, you know, in effect, I, I became 
um, at that time, I, I, I started to think about writing systems and I started to think about, um, you know, the ways in which symbolism could influence how people relate to one another. It's interesting um, because Tolkien was uh, at Oxford for many years and his specialty was language, yeah. Norse, Greek, Latin. He did, exactly. did probably the, the best translation of Beowulf that was ever done. And so that he had an intimate relationship with the myths and epics that those languages created as well. And there's been, you know, some discussion that really uh, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings is a way of understanding, in, in a sense, the fall of man as a creature of, of nature to man with using symbolic power in order to control other people and to control and master nature. Mm -hmm. And there's Bilbo trying to intermediate in order to, in a, in a sense, preserve a way of life where nature is central. So I can understand for you growing up with that intimate connection with nature, that to see how he is in some ways by destiny chosen to leave the security and comfort of that position and go into the larger world. Right. And, and, and it, you know, it's, it's a sense that there was, uh, and, 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 and again, actually speaking quite uh, eloquently about this is that there is a, there's, there's a need to deal with these larger than life forces and these larger than life forces have a kind of industrial component, have a kind of, um, you know, as, as you, as you look at the Lord of the Rings, particularly, sure. there's this, uh, you know, you, th you think about the, the, the symbolism of the ring, right, is, is first of all, uh, it's a kind of deep power that affects the very nature of yourself. Like you can't see it, um, but it influences how you see, right? You can see the ring, but you can't see the magic that's in the ring, right? The, 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 whatever the powers are that are bound into it have a way of reaching into the innermost core of you and then shaping how that core expresses in the natural world in relationships and particularly in politics. And so in effect, you know, when, when we're thinking about something that's anxiety producing, like, you know, uh, you know, I hand you a box and I say, there's something in there that is, you know, you can't see it or smell it or taste it. You, you won't hear it, sure. but it'll kill you, you know? Um, and, and it's possible to make such things like that in the modern world. Like, you know, if you have a, a radioactive isotope, it's emitting, you know, enough radiation that can actually be quite harmful to a person, but you're certainly not going to detect that with any physical senses that we're embodied with. Uh, we won't know that we're getting sick until days later. So in effect, you know, when we're, when we're looking at the kinds of things which are, uh, are in the world that, 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 are, that are like technology, they have a way of, of having an impact on us that, that we don't necessarily understand right away, that are, that are deep and and profound and that these forces need some sort of uh, mediation. They need some sort of, of real conscientiousness in order to be able to navigate. So in effect, the, the struggles of the, the relationship between man, machine, and nature is, is, is something that this narrative actually says something about. It actually describes that, that interchange of, of the relationship between, you know, the machine being kind of the um, sort of system politics, you know, like the, the whole, orc army and, and the, the hierarchy of control and all that other kind of stuff. I mean, you know, the, 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 the engines of, of industry, so to speak. And you notice that that symbolism comes into the storyline, uh, you know, quite a bit actually as, as, as representative of, of, of a particular orientation. And then you have in effect this, uh, obviously, as you mentioned, this really deep embodied nature sense. And then you have essentially, you know, what is this humanity thing that's essentially trying to interpoise between these two forces, you know, the force of, of, of nature as expressed in terms of evolution and technology, um, which, which is not part of evolution, which doesn't have uh, the kinds of, uh, you know, structural dynamics that, 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 that evolution does. And I can go into details about this, but this is, you know, later research that came out of it. But the, the idea here is, is that, you know, when, when thinking about say uh, the Lord of the Rings um, or the Hobbit and so on and so forth, that, you know, again, while these may be narrative things, they did influence how I think about these kinds of issues. You know, it was that rural envi environment along with his uh, 
love of language and the symbolism that came from language, from, from Celtic, from Finnish to Norse mm-hmm. to Greek. He was a master of multiple language domains and could start to see the connections between those epics and those stories. And he brought them, in a sense, into the context of that rural life that he grew up and loved. And for him, the, the great fall of, of England and of the Hobbit community was with the agricultural and industrial revolution, that man then became separate from nature. Yeah. And that estrangement of man from nature, using symbols as a way to control and for power, fundamentally changed the equation that man had with nature. That's right. Yeah, that's right. The, uh, the, 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 the nature of the process of how man relates to nature became a basis for how man relates to man. And in effect, the, 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 this is, you know, you're asking why, what, 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 what was the way in which his writing influenced my later work? Right. A, a big piece of it was understanding how important symbolism was to meaning. And so in effect, as, as I was saying, it's like as, he's, as, as the character of Bilbo Baggins is traveling into Mordor, he is experiencing all of the things in life that he knew to be meaningful as he was losing them, right? So even down to the simple thing of drinking a glass of water, right? You know, towards, towards the last part where he's coming up to Mount Doom, you know, there's a part where they run out of water. Right. And, you know, but, but, but everything, if you just look at the storyline as, as, you know, he's doing this journey, it's, 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 it's very much a kind of, it, it's almost a catalog of how do we know what's meaningful life? Right. And, 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 and the sense of how symbolism is as much a vehicle for understanding that as anything that would be logically factually true. Like obviously we need water in order to, to, to endure and to live, but it wasn't just water, the function to create, you know, the capacity to endure another day. It was water, the symbolism and, the, the whole dynamic of the interplay between those is part of what makes it meaningful in a, in a sense that goes beyond just the function. If we just think about things from a utilitarian point of view, we have basically yielded ourselves to just the, un, the industry, the technology, the absence of nature. And that's not a life I, I want to live. And it's probably not a life that any human being wants to genuinely live and still be human. Right? Then, then in effect, the, the, the notion of anthropology, the notion of, of how we understand the meaningfulness of our lives as a psychological thing. So in this particular respect, for, to really encounter nature, you need both tools to, to reestablish the connection between self and nature, between world as a human construct and nature as a natural construct, um, you know, particularly when technology is is influencing that so profoundly we we have to get back to these these really basic concepts these really basic ideas so i'm wondering if part of it and, and again uh, lord of the rings and, and knowing your some of your own work is whether we have seen a huge shift uh in our const- how we construct cooperation and competition oh yeah it's, that yeah, really, I, I would say for sure we have. In, in, in a way, is the Lord of the Rings uh, a way into that discussion of how we have transformed the way we cooperate, form alliances, how we define enemies, who is the competition, what is competition? I think it can be. I, I definitely, you know, as you're asking the question, and you're asking the question, and it's a new question to me, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm having to reflect on it a moment, but as I, as I explore that a little bit, I, I think one of the things that that whole genre of fiction, you know, particularly the notion of, of elves, there's a, there's a sort of parallel between, and, and, and people are probably going to hate that I even suggest this, but that there's, there's a kind of alienness to elves that is roughly equivalent to the kind of alienness we would encounter with say certain forms of sociopathy. And that, in effect, through the 
vehicle of some of these stories, we can begin to sort of understand what would we need to be as a culture to be able to handle those kinds of forces, those kinds of distortions that would normally interrupt and destroy the fabric of, of, of a society, of a, of a community. And so in, in, in a lot of ways, I think that the nature of fiction itself has changed. And I'm saying, when I, when I say that, I'm, I'm thinking over like 100 year time frames here. Right. But that in effect, we are now looking at a, a much more nuanced through and the kinds of impacts that that can have on a community, on a culture. And so um, in, in some respects to, you know, it, it like, like for instance, and a lot of the things I'm thinking about now have, have to do with what would probably be called good governance. How, how do we do sense making about the world as a community, as a group of people? How do we make choices as a group of people? And how do we uh, embody those choices, actually, you know, do something in, in a collective way? And these questions are, are obviously important because uh, we, we as individuals, we can't do very much by ourselves. It's rare that, uh, you know, like in The Hobbit, for example, the two individuals could have such a decisive impact on, on the overall uh, trajectory of what's happening. And it is the case that sometimes we do find ourselves in places where we can actually, as individuals, make an impact. But that's not the normal thing. The usual thing is we are interdependent with one another and we really need one another in order to make effective change happen. But if we're going to believe in the kinds of uh, processes that result in change, we're going to need to basically know how to deal with bad actors, right? To, 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 to basically understand what it means to have a person's choices influenced for personal gain versus collective gain. And so, you know, in, in effect, the, the, the narrative of, of The Hobbit, for example, mostly took things from, say, a teamwork point of view and how a team would right. relate to one another and so on and so forth. But I think when we're starting to try to understand how to do things in a broader scope, you know, not just teams, but say hundreds or thousands of people or entire towns or cities, that you know, to, to, to really create a capacity for that community to cohere and to actually do sense making and choice making and implementation. We're now looking at issues of how do we make it non corruptible? How do we right. make it so that there's, 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 there's trust that something like the ring isn't going to come in and completely distort or to uh, debase the entire process. So in effect, there's a, there's a sort of analog here of, you know, how do we identify things that are ring-like and trace the influences that those have? Like, how do we compare the notes so that we can identify and then compensate for and then deal with these kinds of energies? Let, let, um, let me uh, ask you uh, this. It's part of the, the Hobbit story. You know, he's, you know, Bilbo Baggins is leading these 13 dwarfs uh, through various junk, you know, heavily dense woods, they're told no, by uh, Gandalf, don't leave the path, it's dangerous. They're hungry. Necessity drives them for a food source. They get captured by spiders, put in these elaborate webs and so forth. So there is a danger of leaving what is the known path because spiders may grab you and hang you up uh, and use you as a food source. But Part, part of what I, I, I wonder about The Hobbit is, and The Lord of the Rings is scaling. How you scale cooperation from leading 13 dwarfs to making a difference with millions or billions of people with the diversity of interest and cultural points of view, historical stories and epics. How, how do you lead that group along the path? Well, that, that's, that's probably one of the single most important questions of how to do good governance. And it shows up in a very specific way. I mean, you know, we talk about Dunbar number limits, like we have pretty good ways of thinking about how to do teamwork and, you know, process management and so on and so forth for groups of, of about 150 people. I mean, it's sort of tribal size. We can kind of fall back on genetically provided, you know, biological resources that we have built into us that, that, that you know, a hundred million years of, of, of animal and tribal living have essentially imbued in us to be a tool and a resource. But 
evolution hasn't prepared us for living in urban environments because that's just not something that happened previously, right? If you if you if you look for uh, what evolution can adapt to, it takes time. And urban environments just haven't been around long enough for, for, for evolution to have been the solution generating methodology. So in a lot of respects to really develop good process for larger groups of people to have the diversity of perspective and then to integrate that diversity of perspective so as to be able to notice good choices or to be able to be uh, a, you know, aware of the values of the community as a whole, um, to do, to do the sort of discovery of, of what does the notion of a solution even mean, right? What does success even mean? Right. Um, and then also, you know, how might we achieve that? Um, you know, on, on one hand, those are, those are both exploratory processes. And, you know, so in effect, um, you know, having the diversity part is actually almost the easier part because you just make sure all of the people are invited, right? Um, but then you end up with this communication problem, which is, you know, how do we learn one another's language well enough so that we can begin to, as a, as a larger group, have the capacity to perceive, you know, what is meaningful, what is life really about, what is success, and, and, sure. and what sort of techniques and tools do we, what resources do we have to solve these problems, to go from, you know, these resources to these embodiments such that, uh, you know, whatever uh, chronic or complex problem is addressed. And so in effect, you know, a, a lot of what I've been thinking about and, 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 and really uh, trying to address is first of all, to, 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 to really articulate the essence of the question that you're asking, which is, you know, why is that hard? Well, there's, there's, there's some very specific reasons. One is, is that the, the number of communication paths goes up, uh, you know, exponentially in terms of the number of participants because of all the linkages that can occur. And then you have, uh, obviously, you know, not being able to fall back on these biological processes. The, the, the thing is, it's more complicated, a lot of these problems, than any single one of us could understand, even if we spent our entire lifetime on it. So, you know, there's, there's, there's tremendous demands being placed upon uh, the communication infrastructure of that community in terms of just sheer bandwidth. Yeah, so, I think that this has been said about uh, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbits as well, and some of the analysis of those books. And that in some ways, the, the mission is a way to reconnect uh, man with nature. And the question is, is, is that an, uh, one of the ideas that has been part of your intellectual framework and your, oh, absolutely. It's, it's, your, it's your like metaphysics? The, yeah, it's, 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 it's one of the goals. I mean, you know, when, when, I, when I think about why am I doing all of this, like, what is this all for? Right. It's, it is very much about the rebalancing of the relationship between man and nature vis-a-vis -vis technology, right? I mean, in other words, if, if, if we're gonna be genuinely, and, and, and I guess I can spell it out in a very specific way. So for instance, if we, if we look at man, machine and nature as a kind of triple. Right. We have the supposition that the machines serve us and that nature serves us as a species, as, as humanity, right? right. But that's, that, that obviously is not sustainable. It doesn't work that way, right? We, which, what you need to have is, is some way to have a, a circle that, that, that flows around that basically means that all parts of it get support. Sure. And so in effect, you know, based upon a, a very abstract idea called axiom two, what, I, what I'm basically saying is in the same way that nature does support us, we need to support nature, but as single individuals, that's actually hard to do. So in effect, if we reorient our expectation from having machines serve us to having machines serve nature, genuinely serve nature, not because we want nature to then serve us, but so that nature can itself be healthy, then we have a realistic possibility of survival as a species. And right. so, you know, in, in a sense, a, a lot of the sense making and a lot of the governance concepts and a lot of the uh, things about this is effectively to restore the relationship between man and nature. But that basically means we need to account for our relationship between machines, our relationship, our, specifically our relationship between ourselves and machines and the relationship between machines and nature. Because if we debase the substrate upon which we depend, then, you know, it's game over. It, it, it's, you know, the, the whole notion of infinite games is relevant in the sense that if we want to continue to be alive as the conscious self-aware species that we are. I mean, if you look at this from a sort of uh, universal perspective, the, the universe is vast. 
you know, a hundred, you know, like 700 billion, billion, billion stars. I mean, you know, you need scientific notation to even think about how many worlds there could be. And um, in, in this specific sense, there's, there's this real understanding that life on this world is unique among all of that, right? That, that, that the level of improbability of our having this conversation is, 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 you know, on the order of a quadrillion, quadrillion yes. to one against. Yes. You know, get, getting back to uh, Douglas Adams and his his wonderful uh, yes. notions of improbability and such, right? So, so in effect, there's a uh, there's a recognition that the meaningfulness of life on Earth is 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 of absolute paramount consideration, mm-hmm. and for us to be so exquisitely unconscious of that is is criminal. And so, this this is getting down to the very root as to, you know why is it important for us to thinking about the relationship between man and nature is because quite frankly, we need to be more conscious of that in order to actually value what is truly there. Yes. And that, you know, nature is not something that's separate from us. We indeed are part of nature. Uh, We may think that we've left the force, but the force is never really left behind. I mean, there's an element, a trace of it in, in all of us. But I'd like to move on to Jonathan Livingston Seagull by Jonathan uh, uh, Bach, which in, in some ways is the story of the classic outsider of having the courage to formulate a meaningful life, even if it is one that is not uh, viewed in a conventional way by most people as a worthy life, or indeed it may be th- seen as threatening and that person is either exiled or oppressed or otherwise punished. What, do you remember at what time in your life you read that book? Uh, Probably before 10. My my father and I were were, were at a, we we were driving somewhere and we saw a a yard sale on the side of the road. We just decided to stop. You know, I was over somewhere browsing through some things and he was over in another place and he, he picked one up and he says, hey, you probably will like this and he handed it to me. Right. Um, and it was actually probably the first quote unquote spiritual book that I'd ever read. Um, and I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing at that, but I, I, I know for sure it was the first book that, that I had received from my father that had that either, anything like that in it. But it was, as you said, it's very much a narrative of a person who, or a character in this case, a bird, but, um, that is is very much experiencing themselves as socially alienated from the tribe or from the crowd. And as you can well imagine, at that time in my life, I was very much that person. I mean, I I was, uh, well, I was, uh, I, you know, again, to use bird metaphors, I was a bit of an odd duck. I really was, uh, as, as, a, as a person that was reading a lot and also very curious, I, I, I was, very, very different than basically anyone else within hundreds, if maybe thousands of miles. And so uh, I I didn't really know that until later as to the sheer extent of it, but I've become aware through certain clues about things that I've remembered at the time that I didn't understand what they meant until later on. But the, the, the the upshot was is that, you know, I was experiencing this sense of profound difference from other people and for a variety of reasons um, to such an extent that it wasn't so much that I was bullied. I mean, I was in my grade school years, but by the time I'd hit high school, I had sort of figured out how not to be bullied. Um, And it wasn't because, you know, I fought back per se, but just because I'd gotten adept at understanding what sort of things would create that kind of outcome and basically shifting the causes. Uh, not being a target, not being in the wrong time in the wrong places, but but just also knowing how to shape the relationships with people so that, you know, they, they wouldn't necessarily think of me as a threat simply because I was different. Um, and, and, and it really became very much about that. You know, how do you, uh, if, if, if people have a hard time understanding you, how do you make yourself understood to them at least well enough that they know that you don't actually have any ill will or unlikely to cause them any harm. There's nothing to be afraid of, in other words. Um, So it became important for me to, to, to become better at conveying that because I became aware that, you know, things that people uh, 
don't understand, they will treat as a threat. So of course I want it to be understood. So the, so, so again, it was kind of in the middle of all that, that, that the, uh, that the Jonathan Livingston Seagull, you know, Richard Bach's work showed up in my life and it was inspiring. I mean, it's a very short book, first of all. So, you know, you, you, you spend, you know, an hour and you've read the whole thing. Maybe but, you could just, just briefly tell, uh, the, the story. I mean, it basically, it's about a flock of seagulls that hang around fishing boats. And I, you, I could see this happening in Maine. Yes. Uh, basically, their, their life is a pretty easy, lazy one. They just wait for some fish. And uh, Jonathan, on the other hand, decides he wants to fly high. He wants to be an expert flyer. This hanging around fish boats for a handout for him seems to be a debased kind of life. But at the same time, that's the convention of the flock. He is, it's not that they misunderstand what he's doing. They see that as something, the other birds, as you're being very odd. You're telling us what we're doing is stupid or wrong or not something that is good. And as a result, we don't like you very much. Well, I, I think there's, I mean, so, so first of all, the narrative is is roughly correct, but it, but it, 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 to me, it occurred to me that it was, it was as much about curiosity, right? So, so he had the, 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 the character, Jonathan, in this case, had an abiding curiosity about the limits and the extents of what could be done in flight. And by proxy, the limits and extent of what life was about. And so, you know, he's, he's discovering these things that he can do while flying. And the rest of the flock, who had no curiosity about exploring any of that, regarded those kinds of things as dangerous. And under some circumstances, yes, they would be dangerous. If you're flying really fast, then, you know, if you hit something, it's going to really hurt and it might actually be fatal. But on the other hand, there is a joy in flying. So Jonathan's experiencing both the, the, the danger, but also the thrill and the discovery and the meaningfulness that is encountered in that discovery. And so when he goes back to the flock, he's basically saying, look at all of these beautiful things that I've discovered. He wants to share. And they're in a sense of rejection of that because they have through you know the, the the narrative of you know what their elders have told them don't fly fast there's no reason food's right here super easy just go for the easy thing why put yourself at risk for no reason and so in effect there was this this sort of social thing that was the the flock is basically saying this is outside of our creed and you are acting against our creed and so therefore we will have to basically to reject you personally because your exploration of curiosity, of course, that wasn't what they would say, but, but in effect, there was a conflict between his desire to seek the full extent of what life was about and the curiosity and the willingness to explore that curiosity and the unwillingness of the flock to do the same. I'm wondering if part of it might go back again to the, uh, the flock was playing a finite game with definite rules and That's right. parameters. And Jonathan, on the other hand, was playing the infinite game and coming back and trying to explain to them. And there was a communication failure right. between the flock and Jonathan because they were in two diff vastly different games. That's right. And, 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 I, and I think that that's, that's actually a really good way to put it. And it connects a lot of these threads together. And it, 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 it basically, when, you, when you're speaking to the failure of communication, you know, I hear that and, and I recognize it as, as actually quite right because there's a, there's a value system that is driving Jonathan, right? Live life to its fullest. Yes. And similarly, there's a value system in the flock, which is, you know, live life, but their sense of what living life means, you know, to, to, to live a comfortable life. And so, you know, their notion of fullest is a little different than Jonathan's notion of fullness. But if I, if I really try to parse that out, at some point or another, you could get the notion that they did actually agree about some things. They agreed about the notion life is good. And their methods about how to achieve that, of course, were quite different. And that that's where the conflict showed up. I think that to some extent, you know, in a lot of cases, when we're trying to learn about how to do communication about things which are deeply important and deeply meaningful, um, to a large extent, we need to search for where that common ground actually is, because in that sense, this, this goes back actually to the question you asked uh, just a minute ago about how do we do the scale thing? How do we get it so that really large groups of people can actually be 
wiser than the individual participants, any one of them, right? Because the, the bell curve of, of the, the, the least and the most wise of us isn't really that wide. And for a lot of the problems that we're faced with as a species, that the wisdom that we genuinely need, just the, the minimum level of wisdom that we need is, is, is far in excess of, of, of what any of the wisest of us could, could, could possibly hope to achieve. So in that sense, we need the capacity of the group to genuinely be much, much stronger than that of the individual in the capacities of wisdom, which basically comes back to finding these deeper truths, finding these deeper values and this deeper meaningfulness so that we can create the capacity to integrate all of these different viewpoints. So in, in effect, it's, it's, it's the, the, the wider the dispersion of the viewpoints, the mo more diverse and varied the uh, the viewpoints that are involved, uh, on one hand, that gives you a wide variety of imagination, but you need to actually connect them. There's there's a synthesis operator that's equally important. And, and so maybe part of I'm, it is, part of it as well is uh, trying to understand what the game is being played by others. Well, yes, but I, I think that just, maybe this is something that the that, 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 that Cars, he, he, he basically by creating such a strong contrast between finite games and infinite games. Um, he really partitioned those. He really described them as distinct and separate. And I, and I think that in a lot of respects, that's actually necessary and helpful because it helps us to become aware of the category of infinite games as a real thing. Sure. Right. Which, which would otherwise be quite hard for people to notice or to do. But on the other hand, I, I don't think that it's always the case that we find that people are only playing one or the other. That, that, that when we become uh, aware of, you know, like f sports examples, I, I mean, so for instance, you listed in the beginning that, that all these different sports a person could play. I'm not necessarily that sports oriented, although I definitely appreciate some of them. I just, my skills are not necessarily anything to speak on. It just happens to be the case though, that when we think about an individual game, we think about it in terms of what it means to win. But we think about a team a team is learning to become better at playing because they want to win more than one season, right? They, they're wanting to develop a capacity to play and that's, a, that's an infinite game orientation. So in effect, there's a, there's a sense here of uh, recognizing that, you know, if we're looking at logical situations like Nash equilibriums or, you know, game theory kind of stuff, we're going to need to understand the literal aspects of it. We're going to need to understand the, the sort of factual empirical truths of it. But then if we're really wanting to understand infinite games and to really know what it means to succeed in an infinite game, we're going to need symbolic elements. We're going to need romantic qualities. And that in the same sort of way that the literal doesn't do anything without the symbolic and the symbolic doesn't do anything without the literal, we kind of need to work with both in order to be able to do well. So in effect, you know, this is, this is another one of those themes that's kind of an overriding theme throughout the, the or, or a very deep theme throughout all of this is that intuition and intellect are needing to be combined. You know, if, if a person has great intuition, but no intellect, then, then to some extent, the intuition isn't going to be recognizable to anybody because there's, there's no way to touch it to something practical. On the other hand, if you have great intellect, but it's, you know, you got all the facts and so on and so forth, but you have no vision about what to do with it, what's meaningful, what is, what is, because, you know, data is not the same as information and information is not the same as meaningful. And that if I, if I want to actually make a presentation, that's going to connect with an audience. I've got to speak the language of meaningful first. If I just yes. come with a bunch of data, it's not going to connect. Yes. So, so in this sense, there's a, there's, there's a deep interplay between the finite and the infinite, the symbolic and the literal, the intellectual and the, and the uh, intuition uh, or the imaginal, right? And that if we're, if we're going to really be able to join these well, to blend them smoothly, to be able to solve problems at the scale of the human species, of our entire ecosystem in a way that genuinely actually works, sure. right? Um, we, we really want to have a very... Uh, good capacity to not just hold a huge diversity of opinions, but also to be able to synthesize those well, to be able to, to have the operator that combines so that the recognition of the value of these two perspectives in a sense leads to an awareness, an insight of the, the deep meaningfulness of which both of these lives arise from. Right. Well, what I'd like to do is, I mean, this is a good segue into uh, 
The next book on your list was Poison Power After the Three Mile uh, Island Near Disaster, right. where in a sense, what we're talking about is that ability to make an influence change, yeah. to communicate uh, where there are dangers, going back to the maze. This is a false false trap door. Don't take that one. Go here. Where it has and again, hidden dangers, yeah. Yeah, the, the hidden dangers. And, and again, standing apart from the crowd, or the Jonathan Livingston Seagull, which I think uh, uh, Goffman does, is a kind of a Jonathan Livingston Seagull kind of character in this story mm -hmm. where the rest of the flock, the politicians, the lawyers, the scientists, the, com uh, the business interests are all singing one particular version of nuclear power. And here's someone who's coming out and said, you're missing the essential point, which is there's a public health right. issue. And that you're over by overlooking that, it, you're in, this is like the, the Bilbo Baggins. You, you have taken this ring of power, this nuclear power, and you don't know the dangers that come from this because it's not right. just symbolic, it's right. real. Yeah. What no, age were you when you uh, came across uh, this particular book? Do you remember? Far too young. Um, far, far, far too young. I, I must have been 12 at the time. And I wow. wish that I had read that book <laughs> later. I, I really do. Because um, that that book, it, it, so, so, so first of all, as you, as you can well imagine, Jonathan Livingston Seagull is a very uplifting book. No. And... Poisoned Power is probably as depressing a volume of book as as as, as you're likely to be able to. I mean, it's maybe not the worst, but it's certainly down there. Yeah, yeah. And so, the contrast between those two is 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 profound in the sense of you know one's very short, the other's actually quite a lengthy read. Um, you know, it's a thick yeah. book, and it's full of facts. It's full of all sorts of of details and so on and so forth. But the abiding impression that it had on me was to recognize that we had developed a capacity to literally end life on earth, right? That, and to do so in a way that was not just a temporary thing, but that was quite permanent. And so in a, in a sense, it was like, you know, on, on one hand, there is this sort of political insanity that's going on, right? You have, you know, business interests and you have government interests and, and, and the sort of, you know, what people think is in their best interest and so on and so forth, but it's all a delusion. Like, so this is going back to the, to the ring. It's like, look at this awesome power, but at the same time it corrupts and the, and the corruption associated with the use of nuclear energy, nuclear energy is, is way, way, way down in, in, in terms of scale. It's really small stuff. So, you know, when you're talking about particle physics and things like that, again, you know, when we're thinking in terms of biological process, we're talking complicated chemistry, but but nuclear chemistry is of a whole different order. And so, in effect, there was this there was this sense of working with something that was supernatural in character, right? That the, 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 the nuclear energy, in a sense, is 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 yes, it's on one hand, it's natural, but relative to what we experience as woods and trees and so on and so forth, it's it's profoundly corrupting. Um, you know, so so there was. Some movies I was seeing at the time, I wish I could remember the name. I'm still trying to actually track that down. Where there was a there was a scene where, you know, some people who had been exposed to radiation were developing ulcers over their body and, and were effectively dying. And, and I was very struck by this because it was around the same time that I had read this book. So it was on one hand, I had this sort of visual uh, experience. And at the same time, I had this deeply linguistic experience. And both of them were pointing out the fact that this, this is, you know, you can't see it and you can't run away. It's going to, it's, it, it suffuses the environment such that there's nowhere you can go. And then of course, right around that same time, there was that movie called the day after. And, and I don't remember the sequence in which I had these experiences, but the, pro the effect that it had on me personally was, was to become profoundly aware as to the fragility of the natural world in the face of technology, which the humanity was unconscious of how profound that impact was actually, that most of us just didn't know. We were aware that nuclear weapons could do some real harm and some real danger and damage. 
and you know again you know this was in the the era in which you know there were alarms you know you'd hear this siren go off they test this thing uh, every now and then for for uh, you know main yankee which was a was a nuclear power plant and it wasn't so far away so you had this visceral reminder every couple of months or something like that of you know shit could go seriously wrong and that it would basically uproot and and and, and totally like completely uh not just disrupt your life but end it and so it affect like i guess uh much of the motivation to really address some of these kinds of dynamics. So again, keep in mind that I was I was coming at this from a psychological as well as a sociological, as well as a technical perspective. So it, it, it was really the combination, the juxtaposition of all these things that, that, that really mattered because in effect, I could understand the psychology of why people would do these kinds of things. What would help groups of people like businesses and so on make these choices, how they could not account for the social health or just the sheer risk impact. Um, so on one hand, you know, this, this sense of alienation because they don't know how much of a risk this is because they haven't really ever come to grips with how profoundly meaningful and relevant this world is as a planet in the entire universe. So, so in that sense, it was like I could get the meaningfulness. I could understand from a technical point of view the literal facts of the matter, like what the actual yield statistics were for nuclear weapons, or what the uh, dispersion ratios would be for, um, you know, a fallout event from a from a nuclear disaster. What it meant for a meltdown to actually happen, not from a point of view of some narrative, but from the point of view of physics. So. Um, and again, this was an evolving understanding. I was studying a lot of this stuff at the time, but that book basically kicked all of that in the high gear. I, I'm wondering if it uh, may also have occurred to you. I mean, this this book, in some ways, putting it in the context of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, this is like uh, Fordo or Bilbo being invited to Mordor to be given an official position and then ultimately to be co-opted and thrown out. In other words, rather he tries to go to get that ring of power in order to put it in an, uh, another direction or at least to make its harm to nature less. But actually at the end of the day, he's defeated by Moldor by Washington, D.C., by all the lobbyists, the commercial interests, the politicians, the scientists, and the lawyers, all stand up. And even, again, going to Jonathan Livingston uh, Seagull, he can try to fly, but he's getting shot down. Yeah, it, and it, it, is, it is very much that story. That's part of the reason why I said it's actually quite depressing is because um, obviously, myself, the person, was not invited to do any of these things. But right, you know, it, it is a failure condition. It's it's essentially, you know, the, the the message at the end is 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 very much of, hey, all of these things are still problems. None of this has gone away, and this was well before the nuclear accident in uh, Chernobyl, and certainly before uh, Fukushima. But yeah. you know, in effect, you know, and 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 there, I'm not saying that that, that there's there's there aren't some. Uh, ways to think about some things that, that are ameliorating some of the worst of these aspects. But nu nuclear technology is, is really dicey in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm more worried about proliferation issues personally, but the, the, the main thing here is, is that it definitely has a situation where, yeah, there was, there was, there was an attempt to try to raise alarm, to, 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 to essentially elevate the signal to help people to basically try to make better choices and that not working. Right. And, and honestly, I think that, you know, a lot of the times when we, when we look at the alternative methodology of, you know, mass protests and, and, and all that, I don't see that as necessarily working either. What, what I'm, what I'm looking for and, and, and what I think is actually genuinely more likely to work. And in fact, probably the only thing that can work is for us to actually do sense-making choice making and implementation collectively that is uncorruptible. So it goes all the way back to the question you asked earlier of how do we do uh, good governance at scale? And so, you know, in effect, um, you know, it, these are questions that of course, that I wasn't asking until much, much later on. I mean, yeah. I, 
you know, it's it 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 it's interesting that at the time, um, I was experiencing it more from the personal level of, okay, this person failed to basically address any of these issues. These issues are now part of the real world. And so I was mortally afraid of my own, just like hearing the alarm go off 20 minutes later, big flash. And a few seconds after that, you know, non, non-existence. And so, you know, and, and, and there were times where I would literally wake up in the middle of the night and I would, you know, run down to the basement because I was, I was sure. scared that it was going to happen right then. You know, like but that's, that's a kind of it's a very natural kind of childhood reaction because yeah. as a child you're looking at what is your sense of agency? How do you influence the world? How does yeah. the world influence? No agency subject? in this case at all. All, all yeah, I can exactly. do is hide. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on from this to the nature of personal reality, specific practical techniques for solving everyday problems and enriching your life by Jane Roberts. Spend a few minutes on that before we go on to Gorda Escher and Bach, but okay. because this is a this is fascinating. Uh, this particular book uh, about uh, a woman who, over a thirty-year period, uh, has communed with a spirit or a guide called Seth, and her husband writes down all of the things that is being projected through Jane. So. What age did you read this? What impact has this book had on you as a child and as an adult? Okay, so um, the book was given to me, uh, again, by a friend of my father's. And um, I, I don't remember the exact context in which that was given, but I, I remember it being someone, a friend of mine that I, I've trusted and, and been part of, have have asked for counsel and and and, and received that uh, you know when I was young and, and and later. So, you know, when he gave me this book, I, I take it seriously. And he had a, a a somewhat more mystical orientation, so he was willing to uh, address things on a symbolic level. Uh, but at the same time, he was also a computer scientist. He he worked at Bath Ironworks, and he had uh, a position of responsibility for their uh, server and systems infrastructure and. And that was a manufacturing entity that had a tremendous influence in that region. Uh, it was one of the larger employers. In fact, I think the crane that's in the yard is still one of the largest cranes ever built. Um, so, you know, we're talking a, a, a very practically mathematically minded individual who also had this deep appreciation of Indian mysticism and of uh, otherwise mystical and spiritual matters. So in one sense, it was uh, one of the rare friendships that I had that could really junction and, and transition between both of those. I just didn't know anyone else who was into computer science. Uh, and, and again, you know, this, this, this must have been after I was 12. I'm thinking I maybe received that book when I was 14 or 16 or something like that. Um, probably, yeah, that, that sounds about right, actually. So when, when I think about events around that and did I have that book, had I read it at that time and so on, anyways, the thing is, is that uh, while the origin of the, uh, you know, did this information come from a disembodied spirit and so on and so forth, I mean, all of that is quite controversial. But what I found from the book itself was a pretty rich understanding of psychology. So in other words, what the book explores is the relationship between beliefs and the patterns that show up in our lives in terms of the experiences that we have. So on one hand, it's very much in the, the genre of idealism, you know, create your own reality and things like that. But on another hand, it was very much a systematic exploration of the influence and impact of beliefs. And, you know, so, so this connects back to, to, to one of the earlier books, which had to do with perception and how do we perceive the world and how did that, how does the, perception and the orientation that we have perceiving the world shape not just how we perceive the world, but also how we solve problems and how we interact with it. So when I was reading this about uh, belief systems and about how to uh, understand the impact and the shape of belief systems and also the workings of how to reshape belief systems, it was very much like a manual for how to change perspectives and how to find and explore different perspectives, how to increase the flexibility of imagination, the kind of stuff that these days most people take psychedelics to do. So in a Okay, so it's more, it's more about a creative landscape. It, 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 
creating different ways of seeing as opposed to being itself a mystical experience for you? Yes. Um, I definitely didn't experience contact with a, uh, you know, a, a remote entity of some sort or another. I, right. I, I never attended any of the sessions. I, I was, I lived too far away. And I, I, by the time I read the book, I think everything had happened already. And, and I, I don't know if she was even still alive. Um, so, you know, the, the notion of my personal experiencing of those kinds of things was, uh, you know, either I was already having experiences or, you know, that book didn't add anything to the experiences I was already having. Um, it just showed you in a way how belief systems were influenced or structured. Yes, but, it, but, but the profundity of that is hard to overstate. We, like, like when I use the word belief systems, I'm actually talking about the full psychological and neural level structures between say the surface of the retina and my fingers. Sure. Like there's, there's, a, there's a tremendous variety of depths of influence through which patterns can live in the, in this space. So for instance, you know, we, we can talk about perception and we can talk about knowing, right? Knowing is a, is a thing that goes beyond perception. Perception is like the raw data field and knowing is kind of what that means, not just in terms of information, but, but meaningfulness itself. Yeah. And then, you know, it, 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 it's in consciousness in a known way. And then it, it turns around and it becomes choices and expressions. But the, the things that inform those expressions is our understanding, right? right? So in other words, the, the choice to, to, to pick up my arm and to, and to do something is, is, is you know, it's a, it's a single event pick something up, right? But to, to embody that, I have to control all of these different nerves to shape individual sequences of muscle motions so that the overall action is, is a gripping thing and my hand overall moves, but that means my arm's got to move a certain way, which means the whole body has to participate in this process. So the amount of information involved in, in, in actually doing something is enormous relative to the choice to do it. So it affects the thing that influences the embodiment of that information, where that information comes from is our understanding. It's, and it's our understanding at a neurological level as well as at a psychological level. Right. So what that book does is it basically explores the interpenetration of all of these together. And more than that, it just doesn't say, hey, there are these things that are patterns that shape perception and patterns that shape expression, and that those have actual real consequences in terms of your relationship to the world. They're literally defining of the relationship between sure. you and the world. And I'm not talking in any kind of mystical way, although you could construe it that way too. I'm not limiting it that way, but I am saying that more than just describing the, the, the depths and the, and the, and the, and the vitality of that, it was also describing what to do when those structures weren't, well serving of, sure. of, of, of your, your, your pattern of life. Like it gave you tools to identify when things weren't working, what not working looked like, what to do to change it from not working to working, what side effects and consequences you might have to pay attention to, what are good ways to make these changes and not so good ways to make these changes so as to minimize the side effects. I mean, you know, we're talking a level of sophistication and detail here, which is uh, rarely touched upon in psychological literature and wasn't really even discussed until cognitive therapy came around quite a few years later. So, so really, whole, it, it was kind of a workshop of the mind. Yes, very a, much so. A, a workshop with various tools, which you could say, I didn't know that tool existed there before. I right. can take that off. And now I, I can actually make something different in the world psychologically than I was unprepared for before. Well, I, I know this. I know the specific influence that this book had because uh, a few years later, when I actually went to university, um, you know, I went mostly to study physics and and, and things like that because that was what or the core of my interest was. And I eventually shifted to studying more electrical engineering and then computer science. Uh, but I was into all of those things all along. But I would not have described myself as having any amount of knowledge of of, of psychology. Right, the whole notion of my having a knowledge of psychology or anthropology or all that other kind of stuff would, would not have even sure. occurred to me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have described myself as having any, any background in that at all. But as it happens, um, 
well, f because of some unique circumstances and because I'd done so much reading and so much self-study at that particular point that when I got to college or, or university rather, it was a main system uh, kind of stuff, you know, nothing to write home about, but nonetheless, the, 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 the person that was my advisor just in half an hour of conversation with me became very aware that I was not your ordinary student. So they put me in this special program, which was essentially carte blanche. I could take any topic, I could study anything I wanted and I didn't even have to take. So the electives were optional. Um, and the prerequisites were also optional. So if I wanted to take a 600 level course and I believed that I could do that and was willing, there were no barriers. Now this is, I think there was only one other student in this, the local system that I was in at the time that had that privilege. Um, but I made full use of this. And so, you know, at one point I saw in the syllabus a, a thing about, um, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a psychology course about, you know, therapy and, and, and process like that. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. I'm really curious about that. But it was like a 600 level course. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, everything that they're saying in the description makes sense to me. Why don't I just try it? And I not only passed the course, but I developed a relationship with the professor. And through that relationship, I came to understand that my knowledge of psychology, at least as far as, as what was known at the time, was actually quite good. And so in effect, it was like, I, I actually understood what therapeutic technique looked like because I had really read and understood what was in that particular book. Right. And so in, in effect, it, and it, it, I wouldn't have believed it unless it had gone through that. And I had the, I had the professor basically saying, no, listen, the work that you're doing in this particular space, you know, because at that point I was starting to write papers and stuff. He was, he was basically saying, yeah, actually this is, this is of merit. And, and, and it, if, if you wanted to, you could make a career around this. And I, and I, and I was like, I, I was, I was a little floored actually, but on the other hand, it, it, it gave me the confidence to basically say, okay, if this is genuinely the case that I that I that I that I understand these issues well enough, then then maybe some of the work that I'm doing in some of these other spaces can actually relate across the symbolic and literal divide in ways deeper than I would have originally believed. That that, that, that maybe some of the things that I'm talking about could actually be relevant at a civilization level, even though um, what I was really talking about at that particular point was personal choice making. So, I'm wondering as well. I mean, this is this is actually a great se segue into Garda Escher Bach, mm -hmm. an eternal golden braid by Douglas R. Hofstetter, because uh -huh. in a sense, what you've just described, your journey of being able to see connection between diverse domains, yeah. psychology, computer science, mathematics, in the case of Hofstetter, AI, language, your language for you as well. I can see that Hofstetter's book must have had a considerable influence yes. uh, in terms of your your own development and your own confidence that here is someone who's doing something very much like what I would want to do myself. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I I, I know that this. Uh, so so it, it it basically the the, the notion that is very central as a theme to Goodell Escherbach is this looping aspect, this recursion aspect. Yeah. And so the capacity for something to see itself or to describe itself as being one of the main things that allowed a logical system to really be able to do some unique and interesting things, to be able to go beyond just the literal and into things which were more meaningful. Um, and, and so there's, there's been a lot that people have written and described. I mean, that, that book particularly has been profoundly intellectual, uh, influential to the intellectual uh, community in general. Uh, but bear in mind that, you know, again, being in, 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 in Maine at this particular point, it wasn't like I had a lot of people to talk to about any of these kinds of things. So in effect, encountering that book was like I was gaining a relationship with someone else who had a deep knowledge about computer science and about mathematics and stuff like that and helped me to understand the relationship between computer science and mathematics because I understood computer science way better than I understand math. And so in effect there was a there was a sense where uh, 
I could then start to see the connection between those two topics and the, the, the way in which that book was readable gave me a real strong sense as to what kinds of things would be needed in order to make some of this, some of the things that I was thinking about at that time more intelligible. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to basically connect a certain, uh, like you, you mentioned this range and flexibility thing. So, you know, back in the, in the beginning, there was this practical embodied physical elements, right? In terms of experiencing woodworking as, a, as an apprentice, learning how to do woodworking firsthand with my dad, with real people in real customer service relationships and, and, and just understanding the practicalities of that, right? Then there was this whole artistic symbolic dimension, which was more represented by my mother, but my father also painted. He had, uh, you know, a kind of artistic uh, bent as well. He did some uh, he did a little bit of bronze casting when he was in university and he had at one point studied to be a Catholic priest. So it wasn't that he didn't have an awareness of symbolic things. It's just that he didn't express it as often because he was doing, you know, day-to-day -day things. And he was, again, a very humble and and, and human person. And so uh, he's still with us, but, uh, you know, again, I, I don't know whether he'll even know that I've talked about him this way, but there's a, there's a, there's a specific sense that my mother particularly was embodying the symbolic elements and that my father could relate to that. Um, and then there was this whole, as I said, uh, logical slash intellectual abstract piece. Cause at that point I had been, my father gave me a, uh, a really early eight bit computer. Um, and, in, and in the school at that time, you know, we had uh, TRS eighties, they called them trash eighties. And, and the, the Apple II had had come out somewhere around that time period and Commodore 64 was around that time period. So, you know, we're talking 80s and I'm in my early, early teens. And so, you know, in that sense, I had discovered computers. I had gotten really into it and, 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 and was very interested in the kinds of things that could be done uh, with logic and with computer graphics and, 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 and so on. And so when, when I started to, uh, you know, as, as, as time rolls forward, right? So, so, so this basis, this triangle of high abstraction, high symbolic and high practical, um, that diversity was then combined with this sense of ex exploring and, and, and curiosity for its own sake, a diversity of mental awareness for its own sake, which then became, you know, really extended as I, as I encountered say, uh, you know, Poison Power or The Hobbit or, you know, the, the, the um, Jonathan Livingston Siegel books. So in effect, you know, this is widening of the envelope of, of, of deepening awareness in the, in the feeling sense, deepening uh, understanding in the intellectual sense and deepening uh, exposure and skill in the practical sense. And so in effect, this, this, this whole phenomenon is that when, when Godel Escherbach was, was part of the mix. It, it was it was as much an enriching in the intellectual abstraction dimension as, uh, you know, or the earlier books had been either ex, ex, extreme extents in the, in the psychological self, emotional self space yeah. uh, versus uh, extreme awareness in the, you know, geopolitical slash uh, environmental slash, um, you know, nuclear proliferation space, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a sense, the the, the, what, what you're looking at is this continual widening of the envelope through which that that process is like all three of these poles are being pulled farther and farther into their extents. It's actually, uh, it's interesting what you're saying because it seems like uh, this book by Hofstetter was a, a time for integration. Yeah. Uh, and it was integrating what seemed to be very difficult standalone worlds into an overall complex system, which you started the, to see the, the connections. It gave the indication that such an integration was possible. The Godel okay. Escher Bach book doesn't really, I mean, it, it goes into psychology and emotion and, 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 and mysticism very lightly. I mean, it barely touches that. But the fact of the recursion element being such a central thing and as a kind of elevation of meaningfulness, or at least the capacity to elevate meaningfulness, uh, really struck me as, 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 as providing some notion that there was a way to do a deeper integration than had previously been thought of. Um, but it, it really didn't come out that that was the case until work much later. Like it was, it was maybe another 10 years before the notion uh, 
of axiom two as a kind of recursion really began to take shape. Right. Um, so in, in effect, I wouldn't necessarily credit that the Goodell Escher Bach gave me the idea for axiom two, but I would say that once I began to become aware of axiom two as a thing, I related back to the Goodell Escher Bach and it gave me confidence that I should continue working in that direction. Just take a moment and explain axiom two for uh, the watchers, the viewers. Well, I can try. Um, so the a very the short notion, one because we're we're we're, we're <laughs> we got a couple more books to go, and we're running a little bit short on time here. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, but a little I'm bit of axiom two would probably give a, a, a context for 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 your statement. But basically, the idea is is that in everything there is flow, and and the and the process of flow is is more profound in the sense that it's it's the it's the, 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 the notion of all process is going to be a notion of flow between three fundamental concepts. And that if we, if we understand the notion of flow in a specific orientation, then we can understand the structure of process in, in that domain. This is, this is about as abstract as it could get. I mean, we're, we're talking like way, way out there. But it's, it's a bit like saying once you understand numbers, then the concept of math becomes much easier to deal with. Right. When you understand axiom two, the concept of process becomes much easier to deal with. And it turns out the process is everything. I mean, you, 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 you look at the basis of ontology and epistemology and axiology, and it's all process concepts. Right. So it's the same with music as well. Yes. In effect, what we, what we can do is we can, we can understand the nature of the domains more fully through the nature of the processes that compose them. Right. Um, and, and so, in effect, this is like the master key that does, allows us to unlock all notions of process. And you're saying that Hofstetter's book was a portal for you into this a way of thinking? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say that, but I would say it was influential because what okay. it did is it, is it gave me a it gave me a set of confidence in the tools that I could use after that. So in other words, it, it wasn't until a few years later, but I wrote a lot of software that had concepts that were drawn from Godel Escherbach. Okay. So in other words, the, 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 the software tools that I created later were, were based on, on some of the concepts in the Godel Escherbach, but the software tools enabled things that weren't in the book. Um, and it was the discovery of what those things enabled that themselves eventually led to Axiom 2, which then I could relate back to and say, well, actually, what's in Godel Escherbach is an example of what's been discovered. But the, what I've actually discovered is considerably deeper and more profound. And so in that sense, it, 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 was, it, it was indirectly influenced by, but it was already more powerful than the thing that which created that influence. Interesting. I'd, I'd like to uh, look at your book by Manfred Schroeder, Fractals, Chaos, Power Laws, Minutes from the Infinite Paradise. Wonderful title. Yes. Uh, and, you know, again, it seems like some of the themes in this book from power laws to self-similar, snowflakes, uh, gateways, so forth, uh, are ones that reappear in kind of an echo in some of your work as yeah, well. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 and couldn't not. The, the thing about the Power Laws book is that it describes patterns that are really, really deep in nature. So things that have a fractal nature have a kind of underlying uh, mathematical description that is, you know, in the form of some variable raised to some exponent. Right. And, you know, the, the thing about that book is that it, it helped me to understand unifying patterns of nature much, much better. It Can you also, give an example? Well, when we look at, say, um, the, the, the notion of fractals themselves, there's a kind of fractal dimension to them. If you look at, say, music, there's also a kind of fractal dimension to it. So, in effect, it's, it's a bit like um, if, if you look at, say, the melodic elements of it, like you, you take a melody and you graph it out, the melody has statistical self-similarity the way the same way that certain fractals that are described in the power law book have so in effect you can measure the fractal dimension of a melodic structure 
Um, and, and music, it turns out, has a, actually a fairly narrow range in which if you depart from that, it doesn't sound musical anymore. Sure. So in effect, you know, by, by, by looking at, say, this, this, this underlying notion of what a power law is and, and some of these underlying statistical sort of things or information theoretic sort of things, you can begin to understand phenomena that are, that are actually quite unexpected. So, you know, you could look at, say, ferns and you could say, okay, there's a fractal uh, repeating self-similar pattern there or snowflakes or uh, the coastline of Great Britain or something like that but that it would also help you to understand what sound musical, why does music sound good? And so part of it is have a neurological nature of how to perceive, um, you know, nature itself has yeah. tuned us to be attuned to it. Music has a dimensionality that is similar to that of how we experience nature. And so what that book did is it made it possible for me to become aware of those sorts of things. Okay, I, I'd like to spend more time on that, but I think we're going to have to move a little bit here. Uh, number nine on the list is Henley's Formula for Home and Workshop. Now, from what you've said so far, I can understand why, as a child, this would have been an incredible book for you. I mean, I, I was unaware of this, but it's a manual for formula, recipes, methods, secret processes, uh, stuff that you know harkens back to a much earlier kind of civilization, a self-sufficiency, a different set of values, a way of being where you have secret formulas and ways of making food and chemical recipes and ways of repairing things. You don't throw, throw things out, you repair them. So if you could just take a couple of minutes to say, anchor this in your childhood, this particular book. Well, discovering that book was, it's, it was basically like having the, it, it, it's, it's like a shop manual for everything. I, I just, I would read through that book and say, I want to try that recipe, or I want to make that thing, or I want to do this. It, it, it basically uh, catalyzed my desire to explore my curiosity in a tremendous number of directions right. all at once. Um, and it gave me the confidence that, that I could do those kinds of things too. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, I, there, there were a lot of things in that particular book that I had no idea were even possible. <laughs> so it expanded the dimension of what was possible by huge orders of magnitude. And it also expanded the desire to explore those kinds of things again by, by, by a lot. So, you know, this is again, very practical you know, straightforward, what can we do in the universe? Like it's, it's a, it's an agency increasing device. Yes. And, and that would really be the case because, you know, for me, again, growing up as an apprentice to a woodworker and, and also having computer science background and all the rest of this sort of stuff, the notion of, can I make it became, um, you know, something that was not just hypothetical anymore, but actually like, yes, I can, because I have the, the recipe to, to do this thing, which was yeah. otherwise impossible. Um, and, and also particularly because I grew up in Maine, many of the things that I needed or wanted as resources wouldn't be available unless I made it myself. It wasn't like I could just go and, and purchase, you know, certain things, uh, you know, certain chemicals, for example, just you, you wouldn't get them at the drugstore. You wouldn't get them at the hardware store because they weren't practical for most people. But for someone in a shop trying to do something exotic with copper, yeah, you might want to have some copper sulfate around, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you actually made things using recipes and formula and methods from this book. I have not nearly as many as I would want to. I, you know, life has only so many hours in a day, but I believe <laughs> me, I would have done more if I'd had the option. <laughs> but yes, I did. I did. I have actually used some formulas in that book. I still have it on the shelf here. Uh, I don't use it as often because I'm not working in a shop as much, I'm, I, but I still do. Um, well, so, I'm really yeah. glad it's on your list because I don't think a lot of people uh, realize this, but in days of climate change and going to a more self-sufficient uh, oh, yeah. We need to know uh, what's in that book. Good. That's that. If, if you're a survivalist and you don't have a copy of that, you probably should get one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's finish with uh, at least a, a little bit of a summary of symbols, signals, noise, the nature and process of communication, which is really the world of Claude uh, Shannon and the information theory. And That's I right. can understand your background in computer science so that this must have been an influential book when you were young. 
Profoundly. I, I, the, the, the discovery of information science is a tool that I use every day. I mean, I, I mean the, the, the work that I've done in metaphysics has also shaped what I do every day. But I, I, the, the tool of information theory is, in, 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 like, I, like if, 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 if I'm experiencing a, a situation where, you know, somebody's advertising something and they're making some claim, surprisingly often I can evaluate the truth of the claim on information theoretic characteristics. It's like, no, that person can't possibly have that information because the amount of information that would be needed is actually this much. And what they have is that much. And there's no comparison between the two. So they're clearly lying, you know? So <laughs> in effect, there's this, there's this sort or of delusional or delusional or just, you know, basically actually they're, they're taking you for a ride and you could know that for certain because of the nature of the background. But, you know, in, in that sense, there's a, it, 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 it's, it's interesting that for a surprisingly large number of problems that the use of information theory has become kind of one of those general resource tools that has allowed me to frame the nature of what I would need to do to solve that problem. If the problem has a certain level of complexity, I at least have a ballpark of what kind of effort I'm going to need to do to solve it. So, you know, how much energy is going to be required to create clarity in that space? What kind of clarity would we be able to expect or not expect? All of these are have information theoretic characteristics. So yeah. in, a, in a sense, um, you know, the, the reading of that book was what I consider to be the true beginning of my metaphysics research. There was a, there was an experience, there was a day where um, I was, I was reading something about that. I was, I was looking at the difference between um, a sign and a symbol, like because because those are different things, right? Semantically, they're 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 they're, dist they're distinct, and so there's a little bit of exploration between, um, you know, what is the difference between a sign, a symbol, and a signal? And I was sitting at a window, and there was a thunderstorm going over the the university at the time, and lightning struck not far from what I was sitting, not enough to affect me biologically, but I was visually uh, very aware of it. And at the instant that that happened, I asked myself the question as to, in a basic raw physics sense, whether or not the lightning, the electrons flowing in that moment were more basic than the sky and the ground. And in a certain sense, you know, the notion of solidness is composed out of electron phenomena. Right, photon and electron phenomena. It's like <laughs> that's that, that's it. That's that's what's going on, folks. Right, gravity is 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 the only other force that we experience firsthand. Everything is electromagnetism. So, the sense of the lightning being more basic than the sky and the ground isn't just a metaphor. There's actually some real merit to that. And Reality. so, in effect, all of a sudden, I understood the difference between sign and symbol in a way that was completely different than the way it had been described previously, and the notion of relationship being more fundamental than identity became what is later known as axiom one. But that moment was the transition between what I was previously and what I became later as a metaphysicist. My work began then, and it came out of reading that book. So in effect, although the work that I've done since then is again, way different than in kind and in nature in terms of the questions and problems that it solves and so on there was as profound an influence as could be had in the sense that my basic true originality began then. Prior to that, I wouldn't have said that I did anything that was unique. But after that, I started doing things which were actually unique. Um, I later discovered that uh, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce had done a lot of work that was related to Axiom One, but I hadn't read any of his work until many time, much time after this, like a decade later before I became aware of his philosophy. So I rederived a lot of the stuff that he'd already figured out, but then I was able to go much farther because of all the other stuff I'd learned in the other books. So by the time we get to Axioms um, 2, that's where the, the crossover happens that, that, that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at this particular point pretty confident that that's unique. Um, and certainly some of the stuff that's come out of that, such as the incommensuration theorem and so on and so forth, so far as I know, has no, no historical precedent. So in, in, in that sense, there's a, uh, a real leaping off that has happened as a result of, of the uh, you know, signs and, and, and symbols book, essentially. So it sounds like this is a book that you would uh, certainly recommend. 
uh, for others to understand the connection we have in the world uh, through information, how we measure, how we understand it, our access to it. And in a sense, you're able to judge, say, a government policy, how much information has gone into this? What do they really know uh, about what they're talking about? Are they dealing with five data points, a million data points? Uh, how is the information being collected and, and well, accessed? Well, it, it, it's that and, it, so, so first of all, yes, definitely yes. And a given policy, what is its scope of influence? Like there's a certain amount of information in the policy itself. How well can it account for the true complexity of the nature of the situation it's trying to address? If, if the policy isn't structured properly, it, there's, there's no way it's gonna be able to deal with the situation that it was meant to because it just doesn't have the resources necessary to do that. Sure. So in effect, it's like there's a there's there's a way in which we can sort of characterize whether a solution or a given policy is even going to work just on the basis of the nature of the scale of the problem itself, and 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 this is this is completely overlooked. I mean, there's 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 I, I I've never even heard of anybody taking this approach to try to identify whether or not we're even in the right ballpark for certain kinds of issues. Right. You know what? This has been a fantastic conversation. We've gone over two hours. It seems like it's been very short. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have opened up in a, in a very wonderful way to give us an insight into how this brilliant mind came to be fashioned the way that it has. Uh, I hope it's been uh, a good exploration for you as well. It has. I've, I've enjoyed talking with you. I, I, I hope to uh, get to hear more of your story as well. I've, I've obviously in this interview, it's, it's mostly been about my story, but I, I'm, I'm curious to know more as well. I've, I've enjoyed this conversation. It's been, your, your questions have been interesting and uh, certainly have, have caused me to reminisce about things that I, I, I may not have even appreciated as much as I do now as a result of your asking them. Thank you. I hope that you'll, you'll come back again and uh, meanwhile, thank you very much, Forrest Landry, for uh, a great, memorable conversation. You're most welcome. If I can be of further service, please let me know. Please stay in touch. Will do. You too. Blessings. Bye for now. Bye.